Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Brian Duffy. I'm the CEO of Watches of Switzerland in the UK. We are the UK's biggest retailer of luxury watches. So we are delighted to be here, and here is Basel World 2017. It's the biggest watch fair that uh, happens in the world. The first ever Basel uh, fair happened in 1917. So here we are 100 years later. Some interesting facts. Uh, there was only a, a total of uh, 29 brands that showed the first time round. And over this next eight days, there'll be a total of 220 brands showing, which just shows you how this uh, market has, uh, has developed. Uh, last year, there was 145,000 people uh, came through uh, Basel World, and they're expecting the same sort of numbers this year. Of course, the most important of them are my team and uh, the team that we have here this evening. Uh, we're going to be bringing you the excitement of what we've seen, uh, what we've experienced, the meetings that we have, seeing the products for the first time. So I'm really delighted to be introducing a, a wonderful panel of experts. Uh, who are going to be uh, helping me this evening, in fact, going to be doing most of the work. Uh, delighted to introduce, first of all, Bill Prince. Uh, uh, we are doing uh, this entire transmission in partnership with our friends from GQ, and Bill is the deputy editor of uh, GQ in the UK and a real expert on their uh, watches, so looking forward to hearing uh, all of Bill's comments. From my team in the UK, we have Faye Terry. Uh, Faye, Faye's been with our company a number of years. She's our head buyer of all specialist watches, knows and loves watches very much, and uh, we'll be giving you her expertise. And we also have Mark Toulson. Uh, Mark is a veteran of, uh, of the industry. Um, everybody knows him in the industry, loves watches, knows everything. He's forgotten more about watches than I know, and uh, we'll very much uh, look forward to hearing Mark's comments as well. One of the most important reasons that people come to Basel World is to see the new product from Rolex. Rolex is a major feature here, it's a major destination, uh, and it's a big part of what Basel World is all about. It is the world's biggest luxury watch brand, it's the market leader in every sense, and it has dominated the 20th century when it comes to luxury Swiss watches. So what, what is it that makes Rolex so special? We ask some people. I think the craftsmanship, um, the status, most importantly. I mean, I think if for any person to wear a Rolex, it's defining themselves as I'm successful and I've made it. In the United States, I think everyone thinks the first watch they want is a Rolex, and then everyone follows that. And mine is beautiful, um, good quality, uh, and value for what you're getting. I just think you know if you've got a, if you've got a Rolex and you see one in front of you, you know uh, with it, without the name there, uh, you know it's a Rolex. For me, one of the most understated watches they have in their collection is Explorer 2. But I, I have that in my collection. I absolutely love it. Like a lot of people go to a Yachtmaster or a Submariner or a something else. I, I like the fact that even as it gets older, it's still in classic. Rolex GMT Master 2. Um, the updated one I think from Basel World a few years ago uh, with the Pepsi bezel. Like a lot of the white gold, white gold sky dwellers, uh, GMTs, submariners, just one because they can pass them off with stainless steel. Anybody who doesn't know a watch doesn't know it's a white gold Rolex. I do like the diamonds in it, and it's not right in your face, if that makes sense. It's very understated, and that's what I like about it. It's very classic, and the bracelet is beautiful. It could be a dressy watch as well as I could wear it just with the jeans and a t-shirt. But yeah, no, I absolutely love this. There's a lot of brands who always, who's only having great watches for men. Rolex has a lot of great watches for women as well. So some really interesting views from, uh, from some folks there about what, why the Rolex brand is so special and why it's such a big deal here at uh, Basel World. Uh, so we could talk brand all evening, but you don't want to hear that. You want to hear about products. So we're now going to get on and talk about the products that we've seen today. We'll be talking about dwellers, first of all, and the very first one is a sea dweller, Mark. What did you think? I thought it was terrific. It was a real thrill to see it. It's the 50th anniversary of the Sea Dweller, uh, and so um, Rolex have introduced, uh, introduced this anniversary model. Uh, I think the significant thing about it is it's, uh, it's true to the original in that it was one of the first um, Rolex watches to have um, words engraved on the case back, so it says helium escape. Uh, helium escape valve, which is what's, what it says on the new model. It's also significant because it's, um, it's a single red, they would call it, because it's got Sea Dweller written in red. It goes down to 4,000 feet, it's 8,350 pounds, um, and it's absolutely perfect. So it has the, uh, the, uh, the Cerachron bezel with, with platinum inlay for the, for the numerals. The significant thing about the dial, apart from the red Sea Dweller, is, is that it has the uh, chromolite 
numerals, uh, sorry, chromolite battens and hands, so it's got great legibility at you know, 4,000 feet under the sea. That's really a terrific thing. And perhaps maybe the, uh, maybe the most divisive thing from the purist point of view is that it has um, a cyclops over the lens. Uh, over the over the date, so most Rolex have um, that's a key feature of, of most Rolex, but the sea dwellers traditionally don't have yep. that cyclops. So some people are going to think that's great. Some people are going to think it's um, it's maybe not true to the original. Um, but it's a great looking watch. It's eight thousand three hundred and fifty pounds. Uh, I think it's going to be a real hit. It's really really impressive. Great, Mark. I mean, it, we saw last year uh, with the Air King how Rolex can just do subtle little pops of, uh, of colour or influence on the aesthetic and it becomes mm -hmm. a huge success. Yeah. I know you were a big fan of the mm -hmm. Air King last mm -hmm. year, Bill. Mm -hmm. Has it done well? It's done extraordinarily well. It's yeah. been one of our top sellers. Mm -hmm. um, difficult to keep it in stock, which is a common situation with, uh, yeah. with Rolex. And uh, just a super cool looking mm. watch, the, uh, the black dial, very much in, in keeping for the UK market. They did have a stellar year last year. And I think for a lot of people, they expect that level of, they want us to knock it out of the park each time. So mm. it's really tough on the, uh, obviously the dial designers and the whole crew at Rolex to come up with something that really grabs. But this is a one masterful piece. Yes, and something simple, as simple as mm. the Cyclops eye in the red to the Rolex aficionados, that's a big deal and it's yeah. a new watch and it'll, uh, it'll be a great success. So the new Sea Dweller and uh, talking about dwellers, uh, Faye, I know you're really excited about the range of the new Sky Dwellers that we saw today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in 2012, Rolex brought out the Sky Dweller in precious metal. Um, it's got a 24 hour display for a second time zone, instantaneous annual calendar and a bi-directional ring command bezel for um, functional settings. Um, it's a good, it's, it's been a great success for us, but it's a high price point, so it's not been accessible to everybody. And this year, um, I know we referenced about uh, sort of out of the park, I think this is going to be a great success for the brand. They're introducing it in white roller saw and yellow roller saw, and at a really, really commercial price point of 10,600 on the steel with the white gold bezel. So you've got the functionality of, a, of an annual calendar, it's the only calendar watch that Rolex do. Um, a, complication it's one of the highest complications and it's just an incredible price point there's three there's three different dial colors on each of the two models which means there's going to be a selection of six um, we're expecting therefore a good supply and therefore readily, readily availability but this is just a, a, a new game and it's a game changer for them I'm really impressed with what they've done with this watch this year and whilst it's 42 millimeters in case size it's quite a big watch I think they've done this beautifully and I'd wear it well, that, which says a lot coming from a, such an expert as you. I know, Mark, you and I were talking about uh, the, the off-center uh, dial that we have here for the date, but we really think the dial colors this time around really, really sets it off very well. I absolutely, I absolutely agree. And I think they've, uh, I think they've made the buttons and the, uh, the luminous bits and the hands a bit larger as well from, from the 18 karat model, which uh, I think it gives it a bit more weight and a bit more presence in the dial. It's a really great looking watch. Yes, and the functionality, the inter-functionality of the bezel and the crown is not something that everybody realises, but now for a much more affordable price, it's something we think will really get the Rolex consumers very excited. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, it's got all that, all that, um, all those functions packed into a watch that looks exactly like a Rolex. You wouldn't know the Rolex. The bezel actually does uh, a great or performs a great part of the functionality of the watch. It's a, it's a great thing. But very exciting, uh, another icon from, uh, uh, from Rolex at uh, Basel 2017 and one of the most iconic products of course from, uh, from Rolex is the Daytona, we were mm -hmm. all very excited last year at the new Cerachrome uh, Daytona and there's even more updates on that product this year Bill. There are, and as you say, last year, I think if any brand owned the fair, if it only for a moment, was Rolex when they showed their new Daytonas with the new Cerachrome bezels. And we had to hand it to jean frederic Dufour at Rolex, the CEO, because he doesn't stand still for a moment. And we've seen the strap before. Obviously, uh, Rolex don't make rubber. They make something called elastoma. And they don't make rubber straps. They make a flexible bracelet. And here it is in all of its glory. But I think what's impressive about this watch as well is this extraordinary yellow gold case. And the execution of the serochrome bezel with the yellow gold picked up in the bezel numerals and this extraordinary rubber strap. I think we all look at social feeds when we get to Basel. I think tomorrow morning when everyone looks at this again, they'll be debating for hundreds and hundreds of hours and hundreds of miles of threads about whether they love it or loathe it. I personally think it's incredible. I think it actually crosses some boundaries in terms of, obviously we know the history of the Daytona, we know it's an automotive chronograph, 
the concept of a rubber strap was developed for a waterborne sport. So mm -hmm. it's, it's mixing, as they say in the designer world, typologies. And there'll be people who really don't like that. They want things to be kept very straight and narrow. But I think for people who are looking for a pop piece, as the Yacht Master, which first came out with this strap on a couple of years ago was, I think people will fall in love with this. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. And, and I totally agree. I think the yellow gold looks spectacular with the, with the black also in white gold. And, uh, and they'll be doing this strap, I believe, in the, in the rose gold version, which is already very popular. Yes, the, we already have the rose gold with the ceramic bezel. So they're introducing the um, oyster flex strap on, on that model as well in various dial executions. So they're adding to the collection um, on the strap on the strap version and it feels like it's part of the legacy again last year when they redid the steel cosmograph it was a as you referenced a huge year for them and this is just a natural evolution um, that's going to be really exciting when we get these washes in store three wonderful new updates to the iconic products of our rolex and a very very exciting start for us in basel 2017 uh, product is what it's all about but not quite the rolex brand is something that excites us all and last week I had the opportunity of catching up with uh, the, one of the UK's most renowned experts in Rolex, someone that has unique access to the archives, and the author of the book, uh, The Best of Time Rolex Wristwatches. It is James Dowling, and the first question that I asked James is, why Rolex? Uh, delighted to be uh, joined here by uh, James Dowling, uh, one of the real renowned experts on luxury watches here in the UK and especially known as, a, as an expert in Rolex. So James, your, your book, Best of Time Rolex Wristwatches, really is a, a reference for, a, for Rolex. Why did you choose Rolex to really concentrate on? I suppose the, the smart ass answer would be that because it's the only real watch company that was ever founded in London. Mm. Um, but in fact, what intrigued me about Rolex was that when I started to collect watches about 30 years ago, I focused on early automatic watches, which was a, a really interesting period in the late 20s, early 30s. Mm. So I used to wear all these watches at various times. And what I noticed was that the Rolex was the only one that worked, was the only one that kept itself wound, that mm. worked properly, that kept anything near reasonable time. So I decided to start to collect early Rolex. And when I did that, I decided to try and find out more about the company. And all I got was this conflicting series of anecdotes from people all over the place, none of which made any sense. So I thought, sod this, I'll go and do it myself. Of the products themselves, which do you think are the most iconic uh, individual products in your judgment? Everybody thinks of watches like the Day Date and the Submariner as the, as the Rolex icons. The irony is that you as a retailer will know that the, the real product, the real icon, the one that sells most, is probably the two-tone ladies' date just, of yeah. which there are more of those around than I think any other model. And that's a market that Rolex have very much created for themselves. It's, it's a ladies' watch that she can wear with an evening dress or to play tennis. And it's a social signifier in the same way that an Hermes Anne bag or a pair of, uh, or a Vuitton bag are. It's, it's a sign. It, it, is, it is a sign. It's a beautiful piece of jewellery. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife has exactly that product with a, a mother of, of pearl dial yeah. on it. And it, uh, it just adds that la last element of, uh, uh, of something that's very, very attractive. How important is Basel to Rolex, do you think? It, it, it's... <sighs> It's what the old anecdote about baseball is. It's not a matter of life and death. It's much more important than that. For Rolex, it's their one chance a year to pitch to their clients, yep. to keep them happy, to satisfy them, and to build on that relationship that is literally a matter of life and death for Rolex mm. and for the clients. Yes, how important is Rolex for Baselworld? They are by far the largest single brand there. Their operation at Baselworld is bigger than anybody else's. Their stand is three floors high and the top floor there's a private restaurant mm. with full waiter service. Yes. Any hint of what you might expect from Rolex or what you'd like to see from them? Well, if we've, if we've all been looking at the newspapers recently, we've been seeing all the revelations about 
Russian hacking and CIA leaks and all that sort mm. of stuff. I always joke that the CIA actually take lessons from Rolex and how to keep <laughs> secrets. They are, they're great. They, mm. they, they, are, they are like the proverbial oyster. They mm. keep it closed yeah. until they want it open. When they want it open, they'll open up and they'll, yeah. they'll disgorge their little pearl. But up until that very moment when the blinds come off the windows at Basel, mm. they keep it tight as an oyster. So the last comment uh, James made there very eloquently was about the oyster and, uh, and the importance of the oyster and what it meant to Rolex in terms of waterproof, hermetically sealed, beautifully described by the marketing uh, genius that Hans Wilsdorf was. And uh, Oyster, Oyster Perpetual remains the most iconic and, and the highest selling product range that we have in the Rolex family. Uh, they continue to move it on, they continue to create excitement in subtle ways. And, uh, and what they started last year and what they very much advanced uh, this year from what we've seen is a movement in the two best-selling sizes uh, for the, the, the Datejust uh, range. And that for men's is the 41 millimeter and for women's uh, the 28 uh, millimeter. Um, doesn't seem a big deal, but it really is a big deal when, in terms of how the consumers respond to this and what it really means. So I know these are numbers you've really tracked and are very excited about uh, the extensions that they're, that they're making in these two dial sizes. Faye, tell us what you think about it. The 41 millimeter this year, um, we were expecting to see these launches, I'll, I'll be honest, but they didn't disappoint. Last year, Rolex introduced the um, 41 millimeter Datejust, which was the natural evolution of the Date Just 2, which was launched in 2009, so it's the larger case size. Um, and what they did was they focused last year on the yellow roller saw and introduced some new colours, so the steel, the, the Ever Rose roller saw also. And interestingly enough, on the uh, both bracelet options, so the Jubilee and the Oyster, uh, the Jubilee hadn't been done previously on this case size. This year was just a natural development in the steel and the uh, white roller saw. Um, they've got a lot of dial executions, they're really clean elegant, timeless pieces. Um, price point is fantastic, really accessible. Um, it's what we consider to be volume. That's not in any way derogatory. It just means that it's very, it's very, very in very much high demand. And again, on the 28 millimeter on the ladies, that was slightly more different. That was slightly different because they introduced a new case size um, from the 26 to the 28. So what they had introduced us last year was the um, steel and yellow and the steel and rose, uh, again, the roller saw models. And this year they've introduced it just on the steel and the steel and white. So type of product that um, is recognizable, is iconic and is accessible for everybody. And uh, very much on trend has been all ladies dials are getting bigger. And in addition, we have a lot of women who are buying uh, products that were originally intended for men. So generally speaking, women looking for bigger, bigger dials. Uh, and the blue dial that we see here, the beautiful uh, Rolex blue, again, very much in trend with the, uh, with what guys are looking for in, in the UK. And I think, again, some other subtle changes to the, uh, to the bezel. Mark, I think there's more flutes on the bezel. I believe they are, and I think the angle is a bit shallower as well. I think um, it's, it's a, it, it looks great, it looks really complete. Uh, I think the lugs are also a little bit slimmer as well than the, than the, uh, the previous um, Datejust 2. It's, it's great, it's really good. Likely to be the uh, biggest selling range in the, in the UK uh, overall. So, so very, very important for the market, mm -hmm. important for us as the, uh, as the biggest retailer in the, in the UK market. Uh, and there's more, uh, there's more to come, um, an update of the, the Yachtmaster and a very, very interesting uh, execution build. What do you mm. think of this? So when people think of Rolex, inevitably, increasingly, they think of the tool watches, and they're quite rightly so, but uh, there are other executions and there are other models that Rolex really do put a lot of weight and support behind. Um, and I think that what we're looking at over the next two watches are two extremes of those uh, iterations. One, of course, is this extraordinary yacht master on the Oyster Flex strap, which we talked about earlier, but with this extraordinary um, garneted bezel. I'm not exactly certain what the stones are, but you kind of don't need to know what the stones are to look at that and go, that's an extraordinary pop piece. We, we'd call it a press piece. I mean, this watch will be photographed endlessly. Sure. I don't think since they did the leopard dial Daytona a few years ago has anyone <laughs> really uh, seen the pieces as, as glamorous and as exciting as this. And it, as an execution, I think it works really, really well. Great balance bezel, great looking watch, Ever Rose, um, Oyster Flex strap, very contemporary, very Rolex. 
And then at the other extreme, if you want to put it that way, is it's, uh, it's a, you could almost call it a sub-brand within the Rolex family, couldn't you? Cellini, it's, it's, dress, it's the dress watch. It has all the codes of a classical watch, which is something that people don't potentially look at Rolex to produce, but they produce beautiful ones. And this particular Cellini, which we're looking at now, I think is absolutely astounding. I mean, it's got everything you could possibly want in a contemporary dress timepiece. It has this season's du jour um, complication, which as we know is the moon phase. This one is embellished with a meteorite moon. It's got a very high shine, almost patent leather strap, which mm. again talks to the, uh, the sort of the classical elements of a proper dress watch, something you would wear at a cocktail party and you'd, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd look after. And then something I particularly love, which is a sweep date, which you don't see that often. As an execution, again, it's very traditional. It talks to the 30s and 40s. I find it incredibly practical to be able to count the days between my next, my next uh, uh, set of appointments, or in my case, uh, press deadlines. But no, so that brings another um, uh, code into the dial. It adds another pop of color in that beautiful blue steel hand. So I think this is an exquisite watch. And I think the two of them combined re represent everything Rolex can do. And in the middle of it is this extraordinary business that we discussed earlier around the Oyster. Yes, and, and, and Faye Cellini becoming more important. It's not the, the sub-brand that everybody knows so well from Rolex, but they're doing some exquisite products, such as we see here with the, the Moon Faze. They reintroduced this model a few years ago, and it's been very successful. As um, Bill referenced, it's the dress watch. So their professional collection is iconic. Um, as is their, their Oyster collection, actually. But, um, you can uh, notice a Rolex on a wrist um, from a thousand paces, and just the variety that the brand offer is excellent. And what they're doing now is building on this, this collection. So you, you can easily have two or three different Rolexes in your collection without it feel like you've got duplication um, and without feeling guilty about it. It's completely different to what we've seen today. Um, and it's interesting that they're, they're developing a little bit more into the complications. We've seen the Sky Dweller and some additional work on the Cellini. Be really beautiful. And I think everything we've looked at today uh, has been, it's been, a, again, a great pleasure. The first day of uh, Basel World and, uh, and seeing Rolex. Uh, as we've done, it's all we have time for, folks. Thanks uh, very, very much for joining us. Do follow us on all of our social media channels, either with Watch Your Switzerland uh, or with GQ. And we'll have more to say in, the, in the, the, the hours and days that come. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us.